in this video, we're going to begin a discussion of register allocation, which is one of the most sophisticated things that compilers do to optimize performance, and also involves many of the concepts that we've been discussing in global flow analysis. Recall that intermediate code can use unlimited numbers of temporaries, and this simplifies a number of things. In particular, it simplifies optimization because we don't have to worry about uh, preserving the right number of registers in the code. But it does complicate the final translation into assembly code because we might be using too many temporaries. And this is actually a problem in practice. So it's not uncommon at all for intermediate code to use more temporaries than there are registers on the target machine. The problem then is to rewrite the intermediate code to use no more temporaries than there are machine registers. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to assign multiple temporaries to each register. So we're going to have a many-one mapping, a many-to-one mapping from temporaries to registers. Okay. And clearly there's a little bit of an issue here. If we really are using many temporaries, we will not be able to fit them all into a single register. So there needs to be some kind of a trick, and we'll say what that trick is. Uh, in a few minutes, and there'll be situations actually when this will fail and we'll have to have some kind of backup plan. But our default plan is to try to uh, put as many temporaries as possible into the same machine register, and doing all this without changing the behavior of the program. So how can we do this magic thing? How can we actually uh, make a single register hold multiple values? Well, the trick is that it's fine for a register to have multiple values as long as it only has one value at a time. So let's consider this program, and I'm going to switch colors here. Okay, it's a simple three statement program. And notice here that A is used uh, in the first two statements, so it's written in the first statement, read in the second statement. E is written in the second statement and uh, read in the third statement, and F is only written in the third statement. And actually, these three values, A, E, and F, they don't ever really coexist at the same time. By the time we've read A, uh, we're really done with it. We've had all the uses of A we're going to have in this little code fragment. Here I'm assuming that A, E, and F are not used anywhere else. And so it turns out that A, E, and F could all actually live in the same register. All right, and that's assuming uh, that A and E are dead after their uses. And what would that look like? Well, let's allocate them all to a particular register, R1, and let's assign C, D, and B each to their own individual registers. Then the code would look like this. R1 would be R2 plus R3, and then R1 would be R1 plus R4, and R1 would be R1 minus 1. All right, so now notice how this is just a transliteration of the code over here into registers, but there is a many-one mapping uh, of names on the left to register names on the right. Now, register allocation is an old problem. In fact, it was first recognized way back in the 1950s in the original uh, Fortran project. Uh, but originally, register allocation was done with uh, fairly crude algorithms, and it was rapidly or very quickly noticed that this was actually a bottleneck uh, in the quality of code generation, that actually limitations on the ability of register allocation to do a good job had a really significant effect on the overall equality overall quality of the code that compilers could produce. And then, about 30 years later, in 1980, a breakthrough occurred where people discovered, or a group of researchers at IBM, discovered a register allocation scheme based on graph coloring. And the great thing about this scheme is that it's pretty simple, uh, it's easy to explain. Uh, it's global, meaning it takes advantage of information from the entire control flow graph at the same time, and it also happens to work well in practice. And here's the basic principle uh, that underlies the uh, modern register allocation algorithms. So if I have two temporaries, T1 and T2, I want to know when they can share a register. So they're allowed to share a register, uh, they're allowed to be in the same register if uh, they are not live at the same time. Okay, so if at any point in the program at most one of T1 or T2 is live, and the more concise way, which I already um, said at least partially, is, is that if T2, T1 and T2 are live at the same time, okay, meaning that there, there's some program point where both are live, then they cannot share a register. All right? So this is the negative form of the statement, and it just tells you that if, uh, if you need two values at the same moment in time, 
In this video, we are going to continue our discussion of register interference graphs and talk about how to use RIGS to come up with register assignments for procedures. And we're going to look at one particular technique that's popular called graph coloring. So first, a couple of definitions. A graph coloring is an assignment of colors to nodes such that the nodes connected by an edge have different colors. So if I have a graph, let's say with with uh, three nodes and it's fully connected, so every node is connected to every other uh, node. And then, then a coloring of this graph would be an assignment of colors uh, such that every pair of nodes that are connected by an edge have a different color. So for example, I could color this node blue and I could color uh, this node green and I could color this node uh, black. Okay, and then that would be a valid coloring of the graph because each pair of neighbors has a different color. And then a graph is k-colorable uh, if it has a coloring that uses k or fewer colors. In our problem, the colors correspond to registers. So what we want to, to do is to assign colors or registers to the graph nodes. And we're going to let k, uh, the number, the maximum number of colors we're allowed to use, be the number of machine registers, so the actual number of registers present on the architecture for which we're generating code. And then if a, if a rig, if a register interference graph is k-colorable, then there's going to be a register assignment that uses no more than k registers. So let's take a look at an example rig. And for this particular uh, graph, there is no coloring. It turns out that it uses uh, fewer than four colors. Um, but there is uh, at least one four coloring of this graph. And, and here it is. So I've uh, used colored labels. Uh, but also register names uh, so that you can see uh, what registers we might assign to each of the nodes. And just notice that although there are many more than four temporaries or four nodes in this graph, uh, we do manage to color it with only four colors and some of the nodes have the same color. So for example, D and B are allocated the same color as are E and A. Just to remind ourselves where this register interference graph came from, here is the original control flow graph again. And once we have the coloring of the graph, now we can do the register assignment. We can replace the temporaries by their corresponding register names, and then we get this uh, control flow graph. So here uh, we've uh, just, just renamed each of the variables in the program uh, with its register that it was assigned to, and now we're very close, as you can see, uh, to having code that we can emit and execute on the target architecture. So far, we've talked about what a register interference graph is and defined the notion of a graph coloring, but we haven't actually talked about how to compute graph coloring. So that's the next issue that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, it isn't easy. So graph coloring is a very hard problem. If you had a computer science theory class, then it will mean something to you when I say that it's an NP-hard problem to compute a coloring of a graph. Uh, if you have not heard about NP-hardness before, that's uh, not a problem. Uh, the important thing is that nobody knows an efficient algorithm for this problem, so there's no uh, fast procedure known. And so the solution that uh, we will talk about, the one that every compiler uses, uh, is to use some heuristics or basically approximation techniques that don't solve the problem completely. But there's a second problem, which is that a coloring might not even exist for a given number of registers. It might be that we only have eight registers on our machine and there is no coloring of the graph that uses fewer than, say, nine or ten colors. And so we're going to have to have a way to deal with that. And we'll talk about that later. I won't say anything more about the solution to that problem just now. So now I'll present the most popular heuristic for coloring register interference graphs. And the basic idea is very, very simple. So what we'll do is we'll pick a node, uh, T, that has fewer than K neighbors in the register interference graph. Okay, and this is actually the key thing. So just find any node in the graph that has fewer than K neighbors. And then we'll eliminate T and its edges from the register interference graph. So we'll just delete that node and all the edges uh, adjacent to it. And then if the resulting subgraph is K-colorable, then so is the original graph. So the idea here is to do a divide and conquer kind of approach. We pick one node, we delete it from the graph, we color the remaining, remainder of the graph, okay, that's a smaller problem with one fewer nodes, and then when we're done with that, uh, I claim that we can find a coloring for the original graph. And why is that? 
In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of register allocation, and this time we're going to talk about what happens when we can't successfully color the graph, in which case we have to do something known as spilling. The graph coloring heuristic that we discussed in the previous video doesn't always succeed in coloring an arbitrary graph, and it may well get stuck and not be able to find a coloring. And so in that case, the only conclusion we can reach is that we can't hold all the values that we'd like to in registers. We have more temporary values than we have registers to hold them. And those temporary values have to live somewhere, and so where should they live? Well, they're going to have to live in memory. That's the only other kind of storage that we have. And so we're going to pick some values and spill them into memory. The idea is that we have uh, the picture in your mind should be of a bucket, and it can hold a fixed amount of stuff. Those are the registers. And when it gets too full, some of the stuff spills over and ends up someplace else. Now, when does a graph coloring heuristic get stuck? Well, the only situation in which it won't be able to make progress is if all the nodes have k or more neighbors. So let's uh, take a look at our favorite register interference graph, the one we've been using in our examples. And now let's say that our the machine we want to use uh, only has three registers. And so we, instead of finding a four coloring of this graph, we need to find a three coloring. So let's think about how to find a three coloring of this graph. Well, if we apply the heuristic, we'll remove A from the graph, but then we're going to get stuck because once you take A out of the graph and, and its edges out, uh, every node that's left has more than, has three or more neighbors, has at least three neighbors. And so there's no node that we can delete uh, from the graph and be guaranteed to be able to find a coloring for it with the heuristic that we discussed uh, in the previous video. So in this situation, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a node as a candidate for spilling. This is a node that we, uh, or a temporary, that we are probably, or we think we may have to assign to a memory location rather than to a register. And let's just assume, uh, for the sake of this example, that we pick F. And we'll talk later about how to choose uh, the node to spill. There's a number of different ways to, to choose the particular node to spill. Uh, but for the illustration of this example, it doesn't matter how we pick it. We just have to pick one uh, to remove from the graph. Okay, so we're going to say we're going to remove, uh, that we're going to spill F. So what we'll do then is we'll uh, remove F from the graph just like before, and then we'll continue uh, with our simplification. And this will now succeed because once we remove F from the graph, we can see that all the nodes, uh, well actually several of the nodes have um, fewer then three neighbors, and so B, C, and D, uh, sorry, B and D both only have uh, two neighbors. Uh, once they're deleted, uh, E and C will only have one neighbor each, and so clearly coloring will now succeed. And here's one order um, that will succeed with this reduced graph. After we decide to spill F and we successfully color the subgraph, now we have to try to assign a color to F. And it could be, we could get lucky and discover that even though F had more than three neighbors, or three or more neighbors, when we removed it from the graph, it could be that when we go construct the coloring for the subgraph, that those uh, neighbors actually don't use all of the registers. It could wind up being that all those neighbors, for example, are assigned to the same register, and so there are plenty of registers left over to assign to F. And so this is called optimistic coloring. So we pick a candidate for spilling, we try to color the subgraph, once we have a coloring for the subgraph, then we see if we just get lucky and are able to assign a register to F, in which case we can just go ahead and uh, continue to color the rest of the graph as if nothing had happened. So in this case, let's take a look uh, what happens. We're going to add F back into the graph and, uh, and look at all, and look at its neighbors, and we see um, that we have a neighbor that's using R1, we have a neighbor that's using R2, and we have a neighbor that's using R3. And so in this case, optimistic coloring will not work. So in fact, uh, F had more than K neighbors, and after we color the subgraph, it turns out that those neighbors are using all K, in this case three, all three of the register names. And so F, well, there is no register left over for F, and we're going to have to actually spill it and store it in memory. So if optimistic coloring fails, as it does in this example, then we spill F. So what we're going to do is allocate a memory location for F, and typically what that means is it will allocate a position in the current stack frame. Uh, let's call this address FA for the address of F. And then, uh, 
In the last few videos, we've talked about managing registers. In this video, we're going to take a few moments to talk about another very important resource, the cache, and what compilers can and can't do to manage them. Modern computer systems have quite elaborate memory hierarchies, and so if we were to start at the closest uh, level to the processor itself, uh, we would find that on the chip there are some number of registers, and these are very fast to access. So typically uh, they can be accessed in a single cycle, so at the same rate uh, as the clock frequency. And the problem is that it's very expensive uh, to build such high performance memory, and so we don't get to have very much of it typically. Uh, you know, you might have 256, say, to 8K uh, bytes of registers uh, total uh, available to you on a given processor. Now, a very significant portion of the die area on a modern processor would be devoted to the cache. And the cache is also quite high performance, but not quite as high performance as registers. Maybe on average it would take three cycles uh, to service something from the cache, but you get a lot more of it. And modern processors would have up to a megabyte of cache. Then, much further away uh, from the processor is the main memory, the DRAM. And this is uh, much more expensive to, uh, to access in time. Uh, you know, typical values would be 20 to 100 cycles, and I think you know, it's more on the 100, uh, towards the 100 end than the 20 end these days in, in most processors. Uh, but you get quite a lot of it. You get uh, between 32 megabytes. Um, that would be a fairly uh, small machine, uh, up to 4 gigabytes for a, a maximally provisioned uh, processor. And finally, furthest away, um, is uh, typically disk, and this takes a very, very long time to get to hundreds of thousands or millions of cycles, but you can have enormous amounts of storage out there, gigabytes to terabytes of storage. Now, as I said, there are limitations on the size and speed of registers and caches, and these are limited as much by power, actually, as, as anything else these days. And, uh, and so it's, you know, very important. Uh, people would like to have as much register and cache as possible, but uh, there are real constraints on how big and how fast uh, we can make these relative to the speeds of the processors. Now, unfortunately, the cost of a cache miss is very high, as we saw in the previous slide. If you, you could get something in a couple of cycles from the cache, but if it's not in the cache, then it could take you uh, a couple of orders of magnitude longer uh, to get it out of the main memory. And so for this reason, uh, people, uh, you know, try to build uh, caches uh, in between the processor and the main memory to hide that latency of the main memory. So that, you know, most of the data is in the cache. And typically it requires more than one level of cache these days uh, to uh, match a fast processor well with the speed of a very large main memory. So you know, very common now to have two levels of cache in processors and some processors even have three levels of cache. So uh, the bottom line is that it's very important uh, to, you know, for high performance uh, to manage these resources properly, in particular to manage the registers and the cache as well if you want your program to perform well. Compilers have become very good at managing registers, and in fact, I think today most people would agree that for almost all programs, compilers do a better job uh, at managing registers than programmers can. And so it's very worthwhile to leave the job of allocating registers or assigning registers to the compiler. However, compilers are not good at managing caches. And while there's a little bit that compilers can do, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, in the rest of this video, uh, the, for the most part, if programmers want to get good cache performance, they have to understand the behavior of the caches on the machine, they have to understand what their program is doing, they have to understand a little bit about what the compiler uh, is capable of doing, and then they still have to uh, write the program in such a way that it is going to, to be cache friendly. So it's still very much an open question uh, how much a compiler can do to improve cache performance, although there are a few things uh, that we've found that compilers can do reliably. So to see one of those things that compilers can actually do, uh, let's take a look at this example loop. So what do we have here? We have an outer loop on J, an inner loop on I, and then in each iteration of the inner loop, uh, we're reading from B sub I, some vector B sub I, uh, you know, you know, uh, performing some computation on that value and storing the results into the ith element of the A vector. Now, 